So mine was a position paper on what do we actually want to achieve. And as a motivation why that's a problem, uh, think of finance. In the 1990s, there was a huge influx of physicists into finance. Uh, their goal was risk management. Ten years later, markets collapse. Who is being blamed? Those physicists. The physicists essentially were working with data. I don't think there is much of a difference between the data science they did and that uh, we are doing. So what went wrong? Now, what's right and what's wrong? It's a question of ethics. They were doing something ethical. Risk management, what could be more ethical than risk management? Still, it didn't work. So we, uh, the conclusion we can draw is, well, we need to maybe be more scientific about what ethics uh, should be about. Well, if you try to be scientific about ethics, you run into a wall because moral philosophers will tell you that you cannot conclude from what is to what ought to be, and you're committing the naturalistic fa fallacy, as they call it. So should we just give up? I actually argue that there are scientists who do essentially ethics, essentially moral philosophy. They're just not calling it that. They are developing footprints. They are developing environmental indicators. And those tell us exactly what we ought to do. But they're not committing the natural naturalistic fallacy because they're using very standard values. They just say, well, we don't want to die in the future. We don't want our kids to die. And we don't want our grandkids to die. So it's, it's classic values, but they're just doing the science right. And I'm arguing that if we want to prevent what happened in finance, we have to do it right. And I think that some of the things that we are tempted to do in this community, like optimizing yield, are very much uh, in the, have very much the risk of producing the same kinds of things that we've seen before, because there are side effects. If we optimize yield, we might be using more nitrogen, we might be using more water, those things go into the... Um <laughs> anyway, um, we need to integrate that. There are some things that are relatively simple. Soil health automatically sort of has the future built in. But I also do think that we have to develop the predictors that have the side effects built in directly. Otherwise, we run the risk that we will be the big evil people 10 years from now. Hi, I'm, can you hear me? I'm Sue from IBM Research Australia. Um, the world is moving towards renewable energy as a way of um, generating clean and sustainable energy. One way to do this is by installing solar PV panels, which convert light into energy. But a study conducted recently showed that at least 80% of these Australian rooftop systems are not performing as they should. Similar figures have also been reported elsewhere. And this is particularly worrying for system owners and building facility managers who not only want to know when, how they are generating and consuming energy, but also when to take corrective action. There are existing literature out there, such as PV manufacturer data sheets. However, these are usually summarized and provide information at a point in time. Furthermore, field deployed conditions are often very different from standard testing conditions. So these are not very feasible for system owners seeking insights on performance. Concurrently, there are also a wealth of information that's growing as we speak. Data loggers are constantly logging PV generation data and weather information are becoming more available to the public. What we propose here is a data-driven framework which takes into account this information and analyzes the impact of each of the environmental variables on PV generation. This can then be used to yield insights useful for the owners. Like the, um, one of the speakers in the morning said, actionable insights. When do you clean? Is there anything you can do about it? How do you improve your performance? What we've done here is to apply this framework to four different data sets in diverse geographies, and the ramifications of the results are different for each of the parties, such as the PE manufacturers, the system owners, and also the building facility managers. So I'll be happy to talk about these results in more detail after my presentation. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Abhijin from Biocomplexity Institute, Virginia Tech. So this poster is about modeling invasive species. 
which affect our agricultural crops. So as you all know, globalization and the resulting trade and travel have led to uh, not only introduction of uh, invasive species, but also their rapid spread. Uh, and uh, this is very important uh, so far as the FEW is concerned uh, because it affects our food security and economic stability. Uh, so here is an example uh, of a very recent uh, development. Uh, so this uh, pest called Tuta absoluta or the South American tomato leaf miner uh, has spread within 10 years almost 50% of our globe. It's uh, a devastating pest of tomato. Uh, it's the size of our fingernails, and uh, it doesn't have great flying capacity, but it has managed to spread this much. And uh, the suspected reasons are uh, our uh, food systems. So one would be the food production systems, uh, such as greenhouses, they are able to sustain our ha the harsh winters and summers in our greenhouses. Then they have been uh, seen uh, in the markets, uh, moving into the crevices of vegetable crates, and then moving to different places. And finally, it is strongly suspected that migratory workers are uh, they are hitchhiking on migratory workers and moving uh, to different places. So the question is, um, how do we effectively model the dynamics of spread taking into account all these pathways? So we have trade, travel, production mechanisms, and many other pathways which we, we need not have even thought about. So what are the goals of such a good model? What are we supposed to achieve? And uh, what are the design and implementation challenges? So this is uh, our, so to know about our vision and approach, so we, we, I have a poster right behind you. It's well taped, and uh, you'll be able to see it. And uh, the, the approach is network-based and data-driven. Thank you. I'm talking about uh, a project that's almost uh, <coughs> still ongoing, but uh, it's part of this work. So what storage resilience under climate change? So it's also linked to one of the topics that you mentioned this morning. I mean, how climate change will impact food, energy, etc. So this is one methodology we have used that show us that there is some challenges of data. But what we, what we have done is we have integrated climate change simulations based on, uh, in this case, for a big dam that re feeds 9 million people in Sao Paulo. And so the question is, we had the drop there two years ago. Does the climate change models can, could prevent, could forecast that? And uh, how does the policies that are in place uh, could are uh, adequate to track that kind of problem or not. So what we have done, we had get data from IPCC, so inter interpanel of climate change. There's a lot of data, many years, hundreds of scientists working on that. And we have used that to put in comparison to historical data and see if the first question could be answered. And then we calibrate a runoff model in the basin this needs to be adapted to the amount of data, the quantity of information we could use to calibrate this model. And once that was done, then we could use the forecast climate change data to go ahead and see, well, what the future would like to be if the climate change, well, some of the scenarios. So part of this that's not really shown here is that uh, we have made a decision support model that we can integrate as much uh, IPCC data as we want once the model is calibrated and see many scenarios. And because we incorporate the policies that are in place today, the policies indicate how much water can take off of the system based on the amount of water you had in one moment. You need to take a, a care account for the risk on the system to, to collapse. And so you, you have this imposition, legal imposition. So we have integrated that inside the model. And so we can see what, what kind of policies would handle the kind of data that are from the climate change. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, myself is Abhimanyu Vatsa. Avi Vatsa is fine from University of Missouri, Columbia. And uh, this poster is, uh, I want to address uh, only two problems, for, uh, but uh, my question is on what. So we have greenhouse uh, experiment, maize uh, plant experiment. And that greenhouse experiment, uh, plants are treated uh, plants were treated with the uh, 
uh, nitrogen and water mixture and we measured three phenotypes uh, difference in height difference in canopy spread and difference in stem diameter and we want to ask two question these phenotypes are independent or deeply dependent second question if they are dependent or independent how many phenotypes available in these data set so uh, this data set is uh, very sparse very small sample size so definitely it needs the non parametric analysis and for that first of all uh, as is well the data analyst analyst is doing first of all uh, make the um, mean max normalization and uh, um, uh, then standardized it for uh, um, uh, making their variance equals such that grouping would be very easy and for that this non parametric methods i propose the novel standardization methods called the sdfs statistical data free distribution uh, normal uh, standardization techniques and then applied the uh, then uh, we want to address the first question these phenotypes are deeply dependent or independent and for that i used like the ortho normal basis transformation for the linearly independent and thereafter use the standard uh, on the standardized data and then use the seven different clustering algorithms we opted the clustering algorithm the density based and subspace uh, clustering and non parametric uh, clustering algorithm why because we are interested in the natural clusters the clusters shape and size should be the <coughs> arbitrary in uh, shape arbitrary in size so that's why we opted this clustering algorithms and the uh, results and everything explanation is available on the poster just right behind the all system control i mean the audio video control that poster thank you uh, hi i'm yichun xie from university of minnesota i'm working with professor shashi shikar on geo design optimization towards better agriculture watershed management uh, so in this problem, we are trying to reallocate different land uses and land covers among all spatial locations in the watershed in order to improve or maximize the water quality improvements under a budget constraint. So we have explored two different strategies. The first one is uh, stakeholder collaboration. In this work, we developed a geodesign software we, which we can let stakeholders get together in front of the big touch display. Um, they can visualize the design supporting layers and then draw the designs, iterate through different design scenarios until they reach the final solution. Uh, so the solutions are shown on the left. Um, so these solutions, they're very practical uh, and easy to be implemented by the farmers. However, um, the water quality improvements achieved is still far from optimal. So in the next approach, uh, we tried linear programming formulation. This time, we can guarantee the water quality improvements we get is optimal under different budget constraints. However, when we map the solution, as we can see on the right, uh, we can see there's a lot of spatial fragmentation in the result. And farmers, they don't like the spatial fragmentation created by linear programming solutions uh, because it's hard for farm equipment operation. So our research question, question is, how can we impose hard geo shape and size constraints uh, in order to remove this spatial fragmentation during the optimization process to make farm equipment operation easier? Um, so currently, we're exploring a sp constraint space tiling based approach um, to try to solve this problem. And if you're interested, more details and some pre preliminary results will be shown on poster just over there. Thank you. Thank you.